helpful now to the epistle of 1 Peter. We want to return to our exposition of what's becoming a very convicting sermon for a lot of us, including yours truly. And uh, we're going to stay with it, though, because God uses these particular verses like Ajax and Clorox to kind of clean the sin out of our lives and remind us of where we need to be living in holiness. Let me go back and kind of set the stage for you. Peter was writing to Christians who were facing severe persecution simply because of their confession of faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah, their Savior. And uh, rather than sympathize with them, Peter simply said, listen, get your minds off of your persecution, off of your suffering, and onto your salvation, and rejoice that the Lord has found you worthy to be tested in your faith. And remember where you were and who brought you out of that mess and, and what it cost to bring you to the salvation. And they were saved and why they were saved and who saved them. Always think about your salvation. When you, when you think you're going through the difficult times of suffering, remember the elements of your salvation. God had chosen them to be saved. If you're saved this morning, it wasn't because of your parents, although they influenced their pastor or some evangelist somewhere. No, it was because the Holy Spirit brought you to the point where you needed the answers to those questions and you sought out those answers from those who knew the answers. But it was the Holy Spirit that brought you that one. Because God chose you to be his child even before the foundations of the world. God was preserving their salvation. Therefore, they should gird up their loins of their mind. They were to think clearly about what was going on, why they were suffering, and rest their hope on the grace that will be revealed to everybody, all to the, to the people of God, when Jesus comes again. So rather than whine about the suffering they were going through, which we have become accustomed to today, uh, God said you, you need to stop and think about your salvation, be sure of your salvation, and rejoice that the Lord has counted you worthy to suffer persecution. Now in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told the crowd of people gathered around him that day, and thus he said, you've heard, you've heard that you should love your neighbor and uh, hate your enemy. That was the Old Testament law. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, we need, to, we need to kind of dust that off again in this generation. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may prove to be the sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, the evidence that we know the Father and the Father knows us, the evidence that we are a child of God is that we pray for those who are persecuting us and we love them. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. So Peter told these Christians... Uh, what he had heard Jesus tell the multitude in many, many sermons throughout those three years, that those who received him as their Savior and Lord would manifest a different view towards the evildoers of the world. In Romans 12, 14 to 20, Paul echoed Jesus when he said, Bless those who persecute you. One more time, because I know I'm stepping on your toes, I'm stepping on mine. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless and do not curse those who are persecuting you. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not avenge yourselves. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you're going to heap burning coals of fire upon his head. And that includes everyone. In other words, this, this is the difference. What, how can we validate the fact that we're saved? How can we validate that we're children of the Father? It's if we act like the children of the Father. Regardless of the circumstances of our lives, Christians are to act in such a way that others can see Christ in us. And for that's the only reason that he's left you here after he saved you to be his witnesses to this wicked, wicked, wicked world. I received a comment from one of our live stream viewers last week and Here's what she said. Well, I guess I'll have to change the way I'm praying for these anarchists who are tearing our country apart. And in quote, well, I think all of us could have written that letter, that little note. She is correct, and she's very correct. Paul said, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Don't, don't look down your nose at those who are tearing our country down. Why? Because of, apart from the grace of God, that would be both of us. Uh, but apart from God's grace, where would we be today? So Paul said, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We're fighting against evil powers, and we're not capable of doing that. We're fighting against rulers of darkness, and we, we, we can't even touch that legion. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness, and we, we better be prayed up before we get into that battle. 
And we're fighting the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, the spirit of the Antichrist is already with us. We're living in the spirit of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And if we're living in the spirit of the Antichrist, can the Antichrist himself be far behind? Now, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say what I'm about to say because you're going to connect 2 plus 2 and equals 4. I don't want you to do that. We need to be careful with what's going on in the elections in France today because uh, that could very well turn the tide of this, uh, hopefully, what appears to be a conservative resurgence worldwide. And if those elections are turned out, Macron will be gone, and that's one of the major globalist people who want to usher in the new world order is Macron. So if you have find a chance today, look it up on the Internet or something and see what happened in, in that um, election today. Now, human beings are committing these sins. They're committing the mayhem that we don't like. But folks, listen to me carefully, and I, I, have, to, I have to watch my own tongue. I have to watch my own attitude here. They are empowered by Satan to carry out his wrath upon the Judeo-Christian values of the world. That's why their actions, now watch this carefully, are mostly at night and usually accompanied by fire. I never could figure this out, but it's always accompanied by fire. They always ha have it at night and with a background of fire. Well, what, what is that a sign of? It's a sign of hell. And so those very same hordes of demons and locusts that had come out in the tribulation are now <laughs> coming out with these, um, with these fires. And so how do we fight that? How do we stand against that without getting angry, without getting in the same flesh that they're in? Uh, how do we do that? Well, we put on the whole armor of God every morning. Don't leave the house without putting on the whole, whole armor of God piece by piece by piece by piece. And be sure, be sure, be sure that we are, before we leave the house, we are free of all known sin. We're confessed up. We have short accounts with God. We have short accounts with others. We pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray against the powers of evil that are destroying our civilization and we pray for the salvation of those who are possessed by Satan. Now, we don't go attack them. We don't, don't dabble with the devil because we know who will win that battle. Only the Holy Spirit has the power to defeat the devil. Um, they, but they're victims of Satan, and one, just like we were at one time, and they need to be delivered from evil. We pray that in our prayer, deliver us from evil. And as we have been, we've been delivered from evil. We are being delivered from evil. We will be delivered from evil. Why? Because that's the promise of God's Word. So we have something they don't have. They have something we don't want. And let's just try to claim the name of the Lord, but without getting into the name calling of those who are tearing the country down. Now the theme of our time of worship this morning, which was wonderful, is how should we respond to the God's gift of, of salvation today? What should be our response? Well, salvation, if I just um, have a couple of minutes here, salvation is the general term that describes the end result of our journey with Jesus. We have been saved with the grace of God. We are being saved with the grace of God, and we will continue to be saved with the grace of God. And when Jesus comes again, we'll be saved with the grace of God. Redemption then describes the method or the means by which that salvation was achieved, and we're going to get to an illustration of that in a moment. Salvation then is the big picture, if you will, of God's plan of redemption. Redemption looks at the price or the means by which our eternal salvation was obtained. Jesus came into the world to give his life as a ransom for many. And he gave his life, uh, that he gave his life as a ransom. That was the price of our redemption. The lost today are in bondage to sin. They are in a hopeless condition from which they must be delivered. There's no way out for them. You cannot decide to go out. You cannot decide to turn over relief, change your life without the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we couldn't either. And Peter reminded his readers to remember how they were redeemed. So must we remind ourselves of our redemption every day. We're saved by grace through faith plus nothing. It was a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man would boast. And so we've been bought with a price. We no longer belong to ourselves, uh, but we belong to the one who's purchased us with his own precious blood. Listen to the words of Thomas Watson an old Puritan preacher in England in the mid-1600s. Listen to these words carefully. Great was the work of creation, but greater the work of redemption. It costs more to redeem us than to make us. In the one there was but the speaking of the word, let there be. In the other there was the shedding of the blood. 
The creation was but the work of God's fingers. Psalm 8, verse 3. Redemption was the work of his arm. Luke 1, 51, end quote. Now you understand why I camp out on these Puritans. In fact, I've, I have determined uh, there may be some exceptions to the rule, but I probably won't buy any more books until the author dies, because only when the author dies can I know for sure he's not going to change his mind. Isaiah 53, 6, the prophet said, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But when God the Father laid upon the Son, when God the Father laid upon the Son the iniquity that we deserve, the iniquity of us all, he brought us back, he redeemed us from our sins, he restored our personal relationship with God. He restored our personal, intimate relationship with the Holy God. The songwriter put it this way, Years I spent where in vanity and pride, caring not that my Lord was crucified. Mer but, uh, uh, and, and nor did I care that it was for me he died. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon was there, was multiplied to even me. There my burdened soul found liberty where? At Calvary. Folks, let's not get too far from the shade of the cross in our walk with the Lord. Why? Because it was on that cross where Jesus died, and the song said what? The wrath of God, said out loud, was satisfied. Take that little insert home with you. Read it every morning, and just let it cleanse your heart. Now, with that backdrop, let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 through 21. You ready? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Where's your faith and hope this morning? Is it in the hope of a conservative resurgence around the world? to restore America the way it was. That's not going to happen, by the way. Where is your hope and your faith? It must be in God. Now, starting in verse 13, I want you to bracket this in your Bible. Starting in verse 13, Peter outlined three dimensions of a believer's response to God's gift of salvation. He began by showing us how we need to respond to God. It's all the way down through verse 21. And then how we should respond to others. That's down to verse 25. And then how we should respond to ourselves. And it takes us all the way down to chapter 2, verse 3. And I want to warn you that we're going to be here for several weeks because uh, I, I want you to understand all these truths before we move ahead. Why? Because if you don't get this down, you'll not understand pretty much the rest of the sermons. This is foundational to our understanding of who we are in Christ and Christ alone. Now, we all respond to our salvation in some way. And I'm sure what... Uh, what we knew to do at the time, we did it. Some of us responded just simply by joining a church, being baptized, getting out our little New Testament, whatever, and maybe doing what we saw everybody else doing. But Peter said, no, there's a deeper response to that. Our first response is to God, and our first response to God is in hope. Look in verse 13. Rest, rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Once we have surrendered our lives unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ, as far as it is humanly possible, we're to consider ourselves as temporary citizens of this world. What does that mean? Well, it means we don't fix our hope on the, uh, on the future of this earth. Why? Because everything in this earth is going to pass away. It's going to burn up. We, 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 we don't fix our hope on the uh, uh, treasures and the pleasures of this evil world, but we fix our hope on the joy of that will be ours when Jesus calls us home, whether it's for the rapture of the church or by our own death. Corey Ten Boom, the amazing woman who miraculously escaped the, uh, Christian, uh, the, the German prison camp, said this, quote, Hold everything in your hands lightly, otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Wow. Hold everything in your hands lightly, otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Beloved, let us not become so attached to the things of this world that we cannot live in the daily expectation 
of being at home with the Lord, whether by the rapture of the church or by our death, our timely death. Second, he says we're to respond to God in holiness. Now, this is not being preached in many churches today. We haven't preached it much here, and I'm, I apologize for that. Verse 15, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Not just when you're here, not just when you're in church and sing and praise the Lord, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. If you're going to be like Christ, Christ in me, the hope of glory, then you have to be holy. If we're, to be, if we're the true children of the Father who is holy, then we must validate that holiness and, and manifest that holiness by living holy lives. We live up to our calling. God has called us to be holy. He's given us every power and every, everything we need to be holy. We just need to live up to that calling. No, we'll never achieve true holiness. Uh, in this life, but we need to strive for it by uh, don't being conformed to our former lust from which we have been delivered, but uh, uh, living in the ignorance of God's word. We don't need to do that. We we no longer satisfy ourselves in the pores and water holes of the world. We we just we 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 want to just stay with the holy word of God so long and so much that we just get drenched by the fresh water of the word of God every day hebrews twelve fourteen. pursue peace with all people and holiness watch this now without which no one will see the lord now understand this we're in christ we're as holy as we need to be why because when god sees me he sees christ in me the hope of glory amen but when we, when we compare ourselves with christ there's a whole lot we need to grow up to so grow up to that which we have been given in Christ, and that is the holiness sufficient to make us acceptable with God the Father. Thirdly, our response to God is an honor. Look in verse 17 through 19. If you call on Father, on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout your time you stay here in fear. Now, I don't know what words you have there in your Bible, but the word fear doesn't mean scared or scared, as we say in Georgia. The word there, fear, means it, it, it's respect. It means honor. Uh, it means reverence. And something, again, that we need to dust off in this generation, those words, reverence and respect and honor. Again, I, I think the church house is a place of respect and a place of honor. It, you, we would not do things in this facility here that we might do just outside or in another building. Why? Because of respect and reverence and honor. Uh, beloved, we need a healthy fear. <laughs> Of a holy God uh, that means we'll no longer treat him with disrespect I, I, I tremble I'm, I'm balancing out my fear here with uh, grace but I tremble when I see those who claim to be Christians but they live as though they have no fear of a holy God the words that come out of their mouth the thoughts of what the actions the attitudes they're no different uh, oh, they'll come in and display their piety on Sunday morning, but um, uh, they display their lack of piety during the week and flaunting their freedom to do whatever they want to do. Paul says, what then? Shall we continue at sin that grace may abound? How, God forbid, how should it ever be? How can we who've died to sin continue to live any longer therein? Romans chapter 6. And Peter said, before we call the fires of heaven down upon those who are expressing their hatred against him by tearing down our society and destroying our so-called American values, we'd better remember that God would also just uh, judge any unconfessed sin in our hearts, for it's only those without sin who can cast the first stone. So we may cover up our sins with religiosity, but that won't, that won't cut it with the Lord. It, it won't cut it at all. We need to be clean before Him. Now, we're still under the big heading of how should we then live. We're under the small heading of here of how we should respond to God for his gift of salvation but to get the full impact of what Peter is saying here I want to go back to the Old Testament book of Exodus you don't have to turn there until I tell you to but it just kind of puts something at the Old Testament book of Exodus there I want to show you the parallel to our eternal salvation and you will understand why this is so meaningful rather than unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament as one of the major false preachers of our day is, is suggesting we must see how our Christianity has grown out of Judaism, 
that our salvation is of and from and through the Jews. Um, and the next time we share the Lord's Supper, I hope to dramatize that for you in a very special way. It's called a Jewish Seder, a Jewish Passover Supper. And I'm going to show you event by event how it parallels what Christ has done for us on the cross. Now, but what I want you to see today is how our redemption is parallel to that great redemptive story of Israel's exodus from Egypt. And uh, I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit right now to anoint your mind that you might be able to comprehend this, understand this, and get the parallel, especially young adults, get the parallel here to what we're trying to say about salvation. Number one, the penalty for rejecting God's means of salvation was death. Remember what I read a moment ago? Genesis 2.17, in the day that you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. We didn't read that, but it, it was imp implied in that passage that if you sin, you're going to die. And that's, that, separate, that death is separation from God. Our sovereign God spoke this universe into being. He created male and female in his image to reflect his glory. But that, that first couple... That first couple listened to the voice of Satan, and they disobeyed God's direct command. As a result of that, God had warned them that the penalty of their disobedience would be death. And God could have, at that moment, struck Adam and Eve dead on the spot, and he would have still been a holy God. But because of his grace, because of his grace, because of his grace, he let them live. But he allowed the process of physical death to begin but their spiritual death was immediate. Their spiritual death, which means separation from God, was immediate. He cast them out of the garden. He cast them out of his presence. So as the result of Adam and Eve's sins, primarily Adam, we were all born with a sin nature. And we were separated from God. We were born separated from God and under the curse of death. Why? For we all sinned. We all sinned. And we continue to fall short of the glory of God. John 8, 34, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. We're under sin's nature. Number two, the provision of God's means of salvation is the blood of an acceptable sacrifice. God is not obligated to save anyone. Why? Well, we're all deserve his eternal punishment. What do we deserve? We deserve hell. However, by God's grace and out of his sovereign love and mercy, he provided a way of salvation for us all. He sent his eternal son, the second member of the triune Godhead, to pay the penalty for our sins, the penalty we rightfully deserved for our own sins. We were born under that sin nature, and the evidence of that is that we sin and we continue to fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for that sin. Romans 3.20, there is the Apostle Paul said, or 3.26, the Apostle Paul said, Therefore God is both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, uh, that's the history of our salvation. That's the history of our redemption. Our salvation, this, is, this cuts cross grain with a lot of preaching going on today. Our salvation did not begin at the cross. Our salvation did not begin at the cross. It did not begin in the mind of Christ uh, as the messianic mission of mercy to make himself a martyr for mankind. Our salvation began in the heart of a holy God even before the foundation of the world. He created us out of the dust of the earth. He formed us in his image, who rather than returning us to the dust from which we came when we sinned, chose to redeem us, to sacrifice his only begotten son, to pay the price that he had established for our sins. He, so he is the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It gets deep, folks, so ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it. So the picture of our redemption is God's final plague on Egypt and uh, his provision for his own people to be saved from that final plague. That final plague was the death of the firstborn. Now let's review how the Israelites became slaves to Egyptians. How did they get in that rhubarb to begin with? Well, number one, because of their hatred for their brother, Joseph's brothers sold him to a caravan of slave leaders who then took him down to Egypt. Egypt is always a picture of the world, always a picture of an evil world. And because of his supernatural ability to interpret dreams, Joseph was elevated to become the prime minister 
of the evil empire of Egypt, and he was placed in charge of the food supplies. He had seven years to get enough food because famine was coming. A famine occurred in the Israel. Jacob, Joseph's father, and the rest of the family of 70 went to Egypt to survive. Why? Because there was a plague and a famine in the land of Israel. Out of his respect for Joseph, Pharaoh gave Joseph's family the, the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen there it was the most productive land in that day. They raised their livestock. They raised their families so much so that in due time the number of, of Israelites exceeded the number of Egyptians. And that scared the, the leaders of, of Egypt. Then a new king took over who knew not Joseph, who feared the number of Israelites, so he forced them into hard labor to reduce their population, but their labor only made them strong and they continued to multiply until there were more than two, oh, about two and a half, even sometimes some estimates of three million. We're just going to leave it at two. Two million of, of the Jews there in the land of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt as you and I were born where? Slaves to sin. Finally, after 400 years, God said it was time for them to leave Egypt to return to the land God had promised them. So then came God's battle with Pharaoh, and God revealed his massive power, magic power, through uh, the series of plagues. But Pharaoh still refused to let the Israels return home. Finally, God said he would bring a final plague upon Egypt, that the death of every firstborn child and animal in Egypt, that was the final plague. Now, you see the picture of the parallel. However, God told Moses, Moses, you go and tell the Jews. The month of Nisan will now become their first month. We're going to change the calendar for the Jewish calendar. The month of Nisan now becomes the first month of the year. And on the tenth day of that month, each family was to take a lamb, according to the size of their family or the size of a couple of families. They were to make sure that lamb was a year old male without blemish, in other words, specific uh, ways that lamb had to measure up and they were to take that lamb into their home and they were to keep it with them until the 14th day of the Nisan. So this little lamb was going around the house. Uh, it was to become a pet. They were to walk around with it, let it eat with them and so forth and maybe even sleep with them. It was to become very precious to them. But on the 14th day, they were to kill that lamb at twilight. They were to dip hyssop in a, a hyssop branch in the blood of that lamb, put it on the two sides and the top of the door, which was, if you'll see on the picture in your study guide, the sign of the cross. And when the angel of death came through that night and saw the blood on the doors, he would pass over that house. That was the meaning of the Jewish Passover. The lamb's life would be the substitute for the life of every firstborn Hebrew. The lamb would pay the price God had required and thus redeem the firstborn of every Hebrew. They were to gather in their homes. They were to eat that roasted lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And they were to eat in a hurry with their loins girded up, meaning their robes tied up around, tied around their waist. And they were to have their sandals on their feet, ready to go, because after this meal, they were going to hit the road. God told Moses, For I will go through the land of Egypt, strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. For I am the Lord, and the blood is on the doorpost, and the lentil shall be a sign for you. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you or destroy you. When I see the blood, are you under the blood of the Lamb? Are you under the blood of Jesus Christ? That's where you need to be. That's the only salvation that you have. That night, as the angel of death passed through, the wailing began. Can you imagine this? The wailing began in all of Egypt as they began to see that their firstborn children, maybe older adults, but they were firstborn, and the firstborn animals were dead. And by morning, they were begging the Israelites, please leave. And not only leave, listen, we'll give you this silver, we'll give you this gold, we'll give you these clothes, we'll give you, just get out of here. And so every year on the 14th of Nisan, the Jews, if you will, reenact this. Um, the, all the events of that night. They celebrate Passover, remembering the lamb who was redeemed, the firstborn, who redeemed the firstborn by his death. And of course, that is an illustration of what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I remember the first time I connected that. 
and I just, it was, I wanted to shout, but I was in a Baptist church and that wasn't allowed. But anyway, you ought to shout, I'm telling you, when you realize that that precious little lamb was a picture of the Lamb of God. Israel's condition as slaves was a picture of the universal condition of mankind. We were born in sin, folks. We were born in slavery to that sin. None of us really grew up saying, well, I want to be a sinner. No, we were born in sin, and we were the propensity towards that sin was already built in. We were captives to sin's appeal. We were captive, if you will, to Satan's domain of darkness, as these people were captives in Egypt and slaves to the Egyptian leaders. Moses said each family was to take their own lamb. In other words, being born into a Christian family, being raised in a Christian home, in a Christian church, is not enough to be saved. Not enough. Each person must come to salvation on their own. Each person must have the blood applied to their sins one at a time if they're going to be forgiven. And while that's a one-time event, it must be continued as well. One time, but continued as well. Second, the lamb was to be a male, one year old and without blemish. This, of course, pictured Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, who was without sin, without blemish. One of the ungodly news reporters several Easter's ago said this, well, Jesus was not a perfect man when he walked upon the earth. He was a sinner just like everybody else. Listen to me, beloved. Listen to me very carefully, young adults. If Jesus had been a sinner, if there was one thing that God the Father could have held against him, then his death would not be the sufficient sacrifice for our sins. His death would only pay for his sins, and you and I would still be lost and under our sins. We better hope that the Jesus that we, in whom we believe was spotless without any sin whatsoever. In Hebrews chapter 7, the writer said, It was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices. Why? Because he is already, he is, he is already he, he's the one to whom those sacrifices are offered. He is holy. He is deity. He is our Savior. Finally, that lamb had to be selected on the 10th of the month, but not sacrificed until the 14th of the month. That confirms Peter's words that Jesus was chosen by God the Father before the foundation of the world to be our Savior, our Redeemer. Now, again, picture that little lamb walking around the house, but the Father knew on the 14th day of Nisan, at twilight, they would have to sacrifice that lamb. The fire upon which that lamb was roasted predicted the fire of God's wrath upon the lamb of God for my sin and for your sin. The bitter herbs that they ate that night reminded us, reminded them of the angst of living outside the will of God. They, they knew they were not where they're supposed to be. They were supposed to be in the, in the holy land that God had given to them, but they were there in Egypt. And so the bitter herbs reminded them of what they'd gone through for 400 years. The unleavened bread reminds us of the purity required to have fellowship with God. No sin. Leaven always means sin. Get, this, get the leaven out of your house. They would dust every corner, every crevice, every crack to make sure there was no leaven. Do you do that every morning? Are you asking God, cleanse my heart of all known sin that I might be as pure as a sinner can be before you today? The eating of the lamb reminds us we must receive Christ into our lives individually to be forgiven, to be saved, to be redeemed. Being religious, folks, is not enough. There must be that personal, individual, intimate relationship with God, and you must come to God on your terms and on His terms, and you all must have a meeting together, and that meeting must center at the base of the cross of Jesus Christ. The Passover marked the beginning of a new year. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, don't have to finish that one. It starts a whole new life, a whole new day. It marks the beginning of a new life. I, I'd rather celebrate the day I was born again than the day I was birthed. Uh, on the day I was birthed, I was probably a pain for my mama. But on the day I was born again, it was because of the pain of my Savior. And that's, that's why I want to celebrate our, our birthday, our born again day. First John 5, 2, he who has the Son has life. John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Who else can promise that to you? Number three, the proof of having received God's provision of salvation is a life of obedience. Not slovenly, not haphazardly, 
but continual obedience. 1 Peter 1, 4, as obedient children. Mark it in your Bible. Go back and turn to 1 Peter 1, 4, 1, 14, rather. As obedient children. Then look, look on down to 1 Peter 1, 21. Who through Christ believe in God, who has raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Obedient faith takes God at his word. Doesn't question it. Obedient faith takes God at his word and acts upon him. To choose the lamb according to God's standards, to kill the lamb and eat it at the right time, to take the blood of that lamb, dip the hyssop in it, put it on the sides of the doorpost and the top of the door. That was the evidence of obedience. That was an act of obedience. That proved they took God at his word. Exodus 12, 28 the Bible says, Then the sons of Israel went and did so just as the Lord had commanded them. Don't you know there had to be those who doubted? I ain't doing that. I'm not doing that lamb. I love that little, that little kid. I love that little lamb. I'm not putting that blood on my door. That's gross. I'm, a, I'm not going to eat that lamb. I'm a vegan. That's animal cruelty. I'm not going to do that. Well, I guess what? Guess what, folks? That meant that firstborn of that family died that night. You cannot disobey God without suffering some consequences. One more time, you didn't say amen on that one. You cannot disobey God without expecting to suffer some consequences. Hebrews eleven twenty eight. By faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that he, would destroy, he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. The angel of death could not touch them. Obedient faith is the only genuine faith. For the people to say they respect Moses and believe they truly spoke for God, but they don't have, they've never applied the blood. If they didn't apply the blood to their own life, they would reveal their, their shallowness of their faith in God and the, and the shallowness of faith in Moses. Get a little personal with you today. That, that lack of obedience would have cost them the life of their firstborn. Hear me closely on this. I love every one of you to death. You know that. But for you to say that you respect me as your pastor and you believe what I preach is nothing less than the whole counsel of the Word of God, but then you never apply that truth to your life. It reveals a shallowness of your faith in God, not only in me, but in the Word of God and in the God of the Word. And I wonder what kind of negative issues the lack of your obedient faith has caused you and your family to suffer. Did you really go to the Word of God? Did you really seek the wisdom of God and the will of God and the ways of God before you made those decisions? Or you just go out on your own? See, obedient faith is seen in the ongoing holiness of God's people. The Passover pictures our salvation in that when we by faith apply the blood of Christ to our hearts, the debt of our sin is paid in full and it's paid forever. Wait a minute, Pastor, what about my sins in the future? They're paid in full. Now that means, that doesn't mean that we get a carte blanche here. That means that the provision for our salvation, the, the provision for our forgiveness is the same as the forgiveness of our past sins. But what we must do is confess those sins and put them under the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Bible, leaven is always pictured as sin. But the Israelites did not put away the leaven to be saved, but because they were saved. Did you get me? They didn't put away the leaven because they were uh, to be saved, but because they were saved, because they knew the penalty for eating leavened bread was to be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Just, those who, just as those who persist in known sin are to be cut off from the fellowship of the church. Did you realize that? We don't practice that as much as we should. I guarantee the church attendance and membership would be a whole lot less today if we practice that. It's why the church is so weak. It's impure. Why? Because many who claim to be members are living in sin, and they're covering up their sin with religion. It won't work. You can confuse me. You can convince me of that, but you will not convince the Holy Spirit. Obedient faith passes the faith down to your children that are deep. In Exodus 12, God instructed fathers that in the latter years, after they were living in the land, God had promised them, when their children asked the meaning of the Passover, they were to take the time to explain to them. See, part of the weakness of the church today is because fathers have forsaken their God-given responsibility to be the spiritual leaders of their family, to take the time, to take the sermons that you're hearing today and break them down to your children. 
Break them down to your family. Uh, to take the time to explain the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Some of them might say, well, their father didn't explain it to them, and I didn't understand that. Uh, well, neither did mine. My father didn't explain it either, but I, I didn't live in that ignorance. How long is it going to take you uh, using those excuses to not do what God has commanded you to do? It's a commandment. Listen, I, I came across these stats. When dad comes to Christ first, 93% of the families will follow in accepting Christ. When the dad comes to Christ first, 93% of the families will follow and accept Christ. When mom comes to Christ first, 22% of the families will follow. And when a kid comes to Christ first, only 5% of the families will follow in faith. That's why God calls you Father. Because you're most like your Father. And our Father who art in heaven is your model. Live up to it. Grow up to it. Become the spiritual leader God has called you to be. Letter D, obedient faith results in God's people possessing the wealth of the nations. Look in Exodus 11 and 12 at some time. Moses said to the Israelites, ask the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and clothing. And God granted them favor from the Egyptians. And they gave it to them. This was God's way of providing for their time in the wilderness as well as the materials necessary to build the tabernacle later the temple. Now, contrary to the word faith movement, this does not mean the church should beg from the world to, to meet its needs. Uh, we don't need the wealth of the world. Uh, we don't need uh, the riches of the world. We need God's blessings. We don't need the wealth and the riches. We need God's blessings. We need God's favor. What does it mean when a church is obedient to the Great Commission, lifting up the name of Jesus as the way of salvation? God blesses that church with the wealth of the nations, folks. People from every tongue, every tribe, every nation gathered around the throne of God, and we're seeing that day come forward today through this little bitty church here in middle Georgia because we're seeing the gospel preached around the world. I take no credit for that, no honor for that. Others are working that they take what I preach and do something else with it. I don't want to know what it is. I just want to preach the Word of God. But I'll tell you that we are in a hundred and some odd countries right now, and that's not just dots on a map. Most of that is some, some sort of correspondence back to us. F, obedient faith is a one-time decision that manifests itself continually, like this ring right here. There was a date 50 some odd, 58 years ago where I said, I do, I love you until death do us part, but that's also a daily, a daily decision and a daily reminder. That, that's why this ring means more than I'm the member of the garbage taker routers of America. It means that I am the husband of one wife, and my wife is sitting there this morning, and that's, that's, that's what this, when you were baptized, when you were saved, that's a one-time decision, but it manifests stuff every day, every day, every day. Well, here's what happened. Even though God spared the firstborn from death, even though God parted the Red Sea to deliver them from their enemies, even though God destroyed the enemies by closing the Red Sea behind them, even though God provided food and water for them every day, hovering a cloud during the day to protect them from the heat of the sun and a pillar of fire at night to protect them from the cold, even though they heard God's voice, even though the whole nation of Israel heard God's verbal voice, and witness his divine protection and provision. You know what they did? They complained. They complained. They whined. They griped. They didn't, well, where is this Moses? He's gone. I don't know where he's gone to. Well, let's build us a golden calf. And they danced before it in worship, and the earth opened up and consumed several thousand of them that day. Beloved, it's one thing to confess our faith in Jesus Christ to be delivered from the wrath of God because of our sins, but it's another thing to die to ourselves daily so that Christ who saved us can dwell within us. And that's the Christian. Peter said once we, were, once we comprehend that, once we comprehend the price that Jesus paid for our sins, we cannot help. We cannot help. We cannot help but live our lives in grateful obedience to the one who loved us so. And the first evidence of obedience is an attitude of gratitude for what God has done for us by his grace alone. Ingratitude, ingratitude is a sin. Did you know that? 
Ingratitude is a sin. In fact, William Barclay says ungratefulness is the root of every sin, for it is the outward evidence of an inward sin of pride. Proverbs 16, 18 and 19, the wisdom writer wrote, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's better to live humbly with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. The meaning of that passage is clear. Ungratefulness leads to pride, then greed, then lust, then envy, then wrath or anger, and then other sins if it's not corrected. How can it be corrected? Here's Paul's answer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ for his people. Hebrews 13, 15. The, through him, in other words, through what Christ has done for us, that no one else could have done, nor we could have ever done for ourselves, let us continually, continually offer up the sacrifice of praise unto God. Let's just praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. A grateful believer wakes up every morning, recognizes that God is the giver of all things, including the breath that he took when he got out of bed. Some good, maybe some not so good things are going to happen that day, but we're to give thanks in all things. But an ungrateful believer wakes up every morning and focuses on that which they do not have, and that attitude of ingratitude becomes the lens through which they look at the rest of the day, but rather than facing the world with the joy of the Lord and the spirit of contentment with whatever God has provided, they pout and complain about everything that doesn't go their way. And we need to stop doing that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. The Apostle Paul listed ungratefulness as the evidence that we are living in the last days of this age. Did you know that? And I'm telling you, the, the ones that I'm reading behind today saying they've never heard the level of ungratefulness of God's people like we're hearing today. In the last days, he said, perilous times will come. Men should be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, uh, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, and so forth. Beloved, although it may, it may be more expensive, we still live in the land of plenty. I appreciate what the song that Tony wrote today. We still live in the land of plenty. And although for reasons known only to God, God continues to bless us and protect us from danger. And yet today's Christians are the worst grumblers and the worst complainers, no matter how we have no matter what we have compared to the rest of the world. These people can always find something to gripe and whine about. Why, some of them would be happy if you hung them with a brand new rope. They would still complain about the rope. They just cannot be happy every day. Well, let's close with this. Folks, every Every person, every Christian is a missionary. You understand that. And your school and your place of employment is your mission field. There's no such thing as a secular job. There's no such thing as a secular job. Just like the Lord sends missionaries to serve as his witnesses among the pagan nations, the Lord has sent you, sir, and you, ma'am, to wherever you're going tomorrow, is your work or your school or whatever it is. That's your calling. That's your primary mission field. And your primary, listen, dads, listen to me, parents, listen, just for a second. because I'm, I'm really burdened about this now, as you can tell. A, a father, as a father and a mother, your primary calling is not just to feed and clothe and shelter your children. As a father and a mother, your primary calling is to lead those children to the Lord. Your primary mission, that's your mission field. It's the most important work you could do and listen doing that work in your home among your children is just as significant as what any missionary is doing on the foreign field or what any pastor is doing in the pulpit today as a student as an employee your primary goal is to reach the people in your sphere of influence in the place where God has placed you and that begins by never doing anything or saying anything that would demonstrate anger or hostility or dissatisfaction or discontent or pride or ego. Why? Because that's not God. That's not the image of God. And if we're God's children, let's act like God's children. Because to do anything less not only destroys your witness and your testimony, 
but it makes a mockery out of our claim to be a Christian. And it also makes a mockery out of the gospel of Jesus Christ that when we're saved, our lives are transformed into the new life. We become a new creature and all things become new. Can we not be happy about that today? Can we not rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, speak through every heart here, I pray. Draw, draw those nets this morning, Holy Spirit. And may, Father, we be found faithful and obedient. May we be found grateful and humble at all the things you provided for us today. Help us never to go out in this world. See those who tear it down and, and realize what we need to see, Father, but for the grace of God, that could be any one of us today. But with the grace of God, we're here. We know you and you know us. And that's the greatest blessing we could ever have. Oh, Father, again, I pray, speak, Lord, because we're listening. And we want to hear your still, small voice today. As the children of Israel heard your bellowing voice from that mountaintop, may we hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit right now, calling us, calling dads to be spiritual leaders, calling moms to set the spiritual temperature in the home, calling students to be their witnesses to their schoolmates employees to be witnesses even to their employer and to fellow employees maybe not with a verbal command and maybe not with a bible but lord just with an attitude of gratitude for all of god's blessings because somebody's going to come to them and say would you give me the reason for the say the next word would you give me the reason for the hope that is within you in the midst of all this wickedness draw the net today father in jesus name i pray and all of god's people said